Uh, we all know the Christmas story. It's one of the most amazing stories ever told. Uh, you've got Mary and the Immaculate Conception, and then her having to tell Joseph how she got pregnant. And then you've got them going to Bethlehem because of the Roman census. They get to Bethlehem, no hotel. They have to stay in the stable out the back with the sheep and the cows. And then Jesus is born with the animals and laying in a manger of all things. And you're thinking this is terrible, but then magi turn up from Persia, bowing down to Jesus with gold, frankincense and myrrh. Shepherds arrive to see the baby Jesus. And then King Herod conspires to kill every baby in Bethlehem because he wants to stop Jesus. It really is one of the most amazing stories ever told. It's, it's worthy of a Broadway musical, I think. You know, various actors in the story, uh, Zachariah, Mary, the angels, they all burst into song at various points. It's like a theatre. And magi turning up in elaborate gowns from the east and angels glowing in white. It's like perfect costumes against the kind of plain canvas of the stable. And then Herod killing the babies creates just the right amount of suspense between good and evil, what is going to happen. It really is one of the most amazing stories. I think the director of this story, who came up with it before the world began, it is truly amazing, worthy of a Broadway musical in my opinion, but the real theatre, the most amazing costume in the whole story is where God becomes a baby. That's the real theatre. That's the real amazing costume as God puts on human flesh, becomes Emmanuel, God with us. In 700 BC, the prophet Isaiah said the Messiah who would come to save the world would be known as... Emmanuel, God with us, a baby who would be God, he said. And then a couple of chapters later in chapter 9, he said that this baby would be known as Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, a child who is God. On several other occasions, other prophets also tell us that the Messiah, the special child, would be the Lord, Yahweh, coming in his righteousness. And this is the true, the true amazing story of Christmas. God left heaven and came to earth because he wants to have a relationship with people like us. I know some of you. That is pretty amazing. God left heaven and came to earth because he wants to have a relationship with us. And here's the special bit. He is a manual God because he wants to be with us every day. Jesus didn't leave heaven and come to earth just so that he could meet you one time in a sinner's prayer. He didn't come all the way from heaven and earth just so that one time in church you'd say a sinner's prayer and go, ah, oh, it's all good. God actually came to earth in Jesus because he wants to be with you each and every day in a relationship. And that's what this passage today is about. Jesus being the gate, Jesus being the way, is about that first point where you come to Jesus. But the story today is about our need of Jesus every day that we're alive. You see, Jesus is the true vine, and in him we find life. I want you to have a look with me. Let's have a look at John 15, reading from verse 1. Jesus is the true vine, and in him we find life. 15 verse 1. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Uh, in this parable, Jesus likens 
God the Father to a gardener who's looking after a vine. And Jesus says, I myself am the vine trunk. I am the graft stock, if you like. And you, my disciples, Christians, are the branches on the vine. And so long as the branches are connected to the vine, the nutrients flow up through the vine into the branches and we bear fruit. But the moral of the story is, don't get disconnected from Jesus because if you're not connected to Jesus, just like a branch, you begin to wither and die and you amount to nothing. But a branch that remains connected to the vine, all the nutrients flow up because God is a good gardener. They flow up through the vine into us and we do well. But we need to remain connected. Jesus is saying, I am your source of life. I am the one who gives you life. Now, just like Jesus has done in the other I am statements, he is now putting himself in the position of God again. By saying, I am your vine, I am your source of life, he's putting himself in the position of God. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, over and over again, God taught his people that I, Yahweh, are your source of life. I, says Yahweh God, am the one who give you, the Jews, life. A and it's true, nowhere in the Old Testament does God actually call himself the vine. But the idea of him being the vine is present throughout the Old Testament. Uh, Psalm 1 that was just read to us a moment ago, it clearly says, is, Blessed is the man who remains connected to God, who walks closely in God's word. And what did it say? He is like a tree who bears its fruit in due season. But those who walk in the counsel of the wicked and become disconnected from God are like... They just die. They don't produce anything. And through, throughout the Old Testament, the constant teaching was Yahweh is our source of life. We need Yahweh like we need air, like we need food. Uh, Jesus says remain, but Yahweh says hold fast. Jesus says remain. Yahweh says throughout the Old Testament, hold fast to me, hold fast to my word, hold fast to me, let me just show you, the, these are parallel ideas. Deuteronomy 13 verse 4, it is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere, keep his commands and obey him, serve him and hold fast to him. The idea is remain in him. Uh, Deuteronomy 30 verse 20, I love this one. Love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life. He is the one who gives you life. Living in relationship with him, you get real life from him. With Yahweh, you live. Without Yahweh, you die. And Jesus is taking the same concept and applying it to himself. With me, you live. Without me, you die. Uh, if Jesus was doing this parable with millennials, you know, young people today, he'd say something like, I am the lightning lead and you are the Apple iPhone. I am the lightning leader, you are the Apple iPhone. Without me, the Apple iPhone is good for how long? 24 hours, maybe 36 hours if your battery's really good. But Apple iPhones come with lightning leads because every day they need to be plugged in and charged. We go to bed every night, we get our smartphone out, what do you do? Plug it in. And if you remember to plug it in, all good. You wake up in the morning, it tells you the time, tells you the weather, gives you music, it's great. But you go on holidays and you forget your lightning lead, what happens? You're in all sorts of trouble. If you've got Apple and you need a lightning lead, USB 2 leads do not work. Your iPhone is as good as useless and trying to get an Apple lightning lead on the weekend, it's nearly impossible. And if Jesus was within, with millennials today, he's, he'd say, I'm like the lightning lead and you are like an Apple iPhone and you need me each and every day to charge your batteries. But you know, there's lots of people going through life today and they like an Apple iPhone and the red lights flashing in the corner because they're running on empty. 
and they're about to shut down. You know when the Apple iPhone shuts down, the Apple comes up on the screen in white, and then it just sort of fades away to black. And there's lots of people in life who are right on that cusp because they've been unplugged from God for so long. The moral of the story here is human beings don't have life in themselves. The human beings cut off from God are like branches cut off from the vine. They're like Apple iPhones without a lightning lead. And sure, we have a battery of sorts, don't we? When God makes us, he sends us out in a little white box and we come fully charged. But we actually come with a lightning lead in there too. It's called our umbilical cord. And it reminds us that we don't have life in ourselves. Our life is derived from another person. And when we unplug from our mother, we're meant to plug into our father. And then he's the one that gives us life as we go through. But here's the point. We, we do not have life in ourselves. The Old Testament, the New Testament both teach us we need God like we need air. We need God like we need water. But the New Testament gives us more Trinitarian detail on how God gives us life. Um, God the Father is like the gardener. He waters, he tills the soil, he puts fertilizer on it, and then Jesus is like the vine. And the nutrients come up through the vine and they feed the branches. And guess what? The Holy Spirit is like the nutrients coming up through us. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit give us life. If you prefer the 21st century version, think of God as the the power plant or the energy plant. Of course, it's green energy because God's good. <laughs> but think of God, God the Father as the energy plant and Jesus is the electricity network or the lightning cable who brings life from God the Father through to us and think of the Holy Spirit as the actual energy that is coming into our life and sustaining us and giving us strength. And this is what God is doing for us. Each and every day, we need God in our lives to keep us going. But many people don't realize they've unplugged, the light's flashing, it's not working properly anymore, and... Jesus says, come to me. He says, I am the gate. I am the way back to the Father. But he also says, do you notice these words today? The word remain is a present continuous thing. It's not a one-off thing. Uh, the word hold fast, again, is not a one-off thing. It's something that you have to do constantly and all the time. And Jesus is saying, you need to remain with me. You need to come to me, but then you need to remain with me. Now, human beings can only truly connect to God through Jesus. Like I said, he's an Apple Lightning lead, and USB 2s won't work. Muhammad won't work. Buddha won't work. Only Jesus can actually really can reconnect you to God. But once you're reconnected, you've got to stay connected. And the question is, how do you stay connected? You've come to Jesus, you've said that sinner's prayer, and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm saved. How do you stay connected? Jesus is the vine, and we stay connected to him through his word. Jesus is the vine, and we stay connected to him through his word. Have a look with me, reading from verse 5. Look at verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and the connection to God will be perfect. It will be given to you. Notice what he says. Remain in me and my words remain in you. But they're not two separate things. They're actually one thing. Remaining in Jesus is the same as making sure his words remain in you. The way God connects to us 
is through Jesus and specifically through Jesus' words. Uh, through Jesus' words, God tells us who he is. He tells us what he is like. He tells us how he wants us to live. So the way we remain connected to God the Father is through Jesus and focusing on Jesus' words. It is through Jesus' words that we remain in him. But friends, this is primarily talking about Jesus' actual words that he spoke while he was here on earth. The words that Jesus wants you to remain in are his words that are recorded in the Bible. Lots of us think, I, I hear directly from Jesus, he just talks to me. You know what the Bible says? Sometimes that's our delusion. Sometimes that's actually evil spirits. And it actually needs to be tested against God's word in the Bible. Test the spirits, it says. And so what Jesus actually wants you to do is not remain in this. He wants you to remain in this. In this word, remain in this word and Jesus will remain in you. Uh, as we spend time in Jesus' words and with Jesus, something actually happens in the spiritual realm. Something spiritual happens. As you are spending time in Jesus' word, the Holy Spirit is coming into your life through that word, and he is applying different things to your life, even as you're reading the word. You may have read the same word seven times before, and he'll take different things out of there and apply them to you as you need to hear them. And he will show you things he wants you to do. Sometimes he'll show you things that you are doing really foolish, and he's going, stop doing that before you land on your face. <laughs> and he also shows you where to invest your time and your energy and your money. As we spend time in God's word, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, actually leads us into life that is really life. But guys, this only happens as we spend time in God's word. Let me say that again. It happens when we spend time in God's word. I think lots of Christians today are getting lazy. We're getting lazy. And a lot of Christians sort of communicate to me, oh, I read Matthew chapter 6 and 7 back in 2010. I know what it says. I don't need to read it again. I read the Bible once. I don't need to read it anymore. Really? If I asked you, Matthew chapter 6 and 7, two of the best known chapters in the Bible, can you actually tell me what they say and how it applies to your life? Hmm. <laughs> The reality is most of us need to be reminded repeatedly and again and again and again. And many of us think, I I I've actually read the Bible, I've heard lots of sermons, God has got nothing more to teach me because I know it all and it's okay. And you know what, that's really proud, that's really arrogant, and the Bible says that pride comes before a fall. A few years ago, God convicted me. This is me, God applying his word to me. He convicted me that I don't avoid the Bible because I'm too busy. I avoid the Bible because I'm too arrogant. Let me say that again. I don't ignore God's word because I'm too busy. I ignore God's word because I'm too proud. We make time for that which we think is important cleaning our teeth, eating, showering. But we reach a point where we think, I don't need God's word. It's not actually adding anything to my life. I'm okay on my own. I know it all myself. And at that point, alarm bells should be going off. When I get into that place, it is not good. Look with me again at verse six. Just look again at verse six. Verse 6, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. That's a real warning, isn't it? That's actually a real warning from Jesus. Uh, theologians sometimes debate, can a Christian lose their salvation or not? This is a theological debate. Can Christians lose their salvation? 
Some theologians say, yes, they can. Some theologians say, no, you can't. I'm on the end of, no, you can't. Because Romans 8 says that once you're a Christian, nothing in all creation, neither angels nor demons, neither height nor depth nor breadth, can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So I'm on that end. But friends, that does not mean that you then say, I said a sinner's prayer once, it doesn't matter, I'm saved, that's all good, I don't have to worry about anything else. That's not true Christianity. The book of Philippians says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The book of Hebrews says, do not be like those crazy Old Testament Jews who hardened their hearts to God's word and failed to enter the promised land. And Jesus says, you're one of my disciples, remain in my words, otherwise you'll be like a branch that is cut off, thrown away and burnt. We have to take that seriously. Now, if you're a real Christian and Jesus says that, what do you do? Come on, come on. If you're a real Christian and Jesus says, remain in my words, what do you do? And you never lose your salvation. <laughs> Isn't that true? Christians remain in his word, they don't lose their salvation. Guys, this, this passage, there's a carrot and a stick. You know when you want to move a donkey, you have a carrot and a stick. The stick is, if you don't remain in Jesus' words, you're going to wither, you're going to die, and you're going to be thrown away. And the carrot is, but if you remain in Jesus' words, you're going to bear lots of fruit to God's glory. Now, who here in thanks to God wants to bear lots of fruit to God's glory? Do you want to have a productive Christian life where you actually store up treasure in heaven, remain in God's word? You want to live a life of joy and love and peace and glory to God, remain in Jesus' word. We need Jesus' word. And if we're too busy to spend time in Jesus' word, it's actually arrogance. It's not busyness. We have his word. He has given it to us because it is life. And his personal testimony, the number of times God has saved me while I'm in his word, I, I probably can't count. There have been times when I've been close to going, I don't want to be in ministry anymore. I want to leave, I want to stop being a pastor, and the only thing that's kept me going is being in God's word day by day. He's given me the strength to get up the next morning and put my foot in front of the other. There are numerous occasions where I'm about to make really dumb, stupid decisions, and I've been reading God's word, and he's gone, you really don't want to do that, Matt. And he's saved me again and again and again, and Jesus is saying, don't just come to me one time in a sinner's prayer. Come to me and then remain with me. Stay in my word. I have so much to teach you because I love you. My final point today, though, is that hearing Jesus' word is not enough. Jesus is the true vine. He doesn't just want us to hear his word. He wants us to obey his word. And Jesus, the true vine, he wants us to obey his word. Look with me at verse 9. Reading from verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Uh, the last thing we see is Jesus says, if you obey my words, you will remain in my love. If you obey my words, you will remain in love. That sounds conditional, doesn't it? It sounds conditional. It, it sounds like Jesus is saying, if you obey me, I will keep loving you. But we know it can't be saying that because other parts of the Bible tell us that Jesus' love is unconditional. Jesus loves us unconditionally. So what is this actually saying? Uh, all of Jesus' commands are about love. Let me just say that all of Jesus' commands are about how to love God with all your heart 
and how to love your neighbour as yourself. And what Jesus is saying is, if you listen to me and you obey my commands, you're actually going to walk in love. You will actually love God with all your heart and love your neighbour as yourself. But if you don't listen to me and you ignore my commands, you're not going to walk in love. You're not going to stay in that path of love that I've set out for you. So Jesus is saying, listen to me, obey my commands, and then you really will walk the Christian life of love for God and love for neighbour as yourself. Um, When you spend quality time with Jesus listening to him, seeing what he's like, you actually start to become like him. That's the amazing thing. When you spend quality time with Jesus, listening to him, seeing what he's like, you start to become like him. But when you stop spending quality time with Jesus and you just spend all your time in the world, which is hectic, it's dog eat dog, survival of the fittest, greed, we start becoming like the world. When we don't spend quality time with Jesus, we actually take on the characteristics, the attitudes, the thinking of the world, and we become greedy, we become selfish, and we become narcissistic. Without Jesus, human beings become narcissistic and welcome to the 21st century. That's what's happening. We need time with Jesus to see what he is like. And then as we see what he is like, we walk like him and we actually love God with all our heart and we love our neighbour as ourself. And guess what you reap when you really love? What do you reap when you really love God with all your heart and love your neighbour as yourself? You reap joy. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. Verse 11... I have told you this, so I've told you to remain in my word, I've told you to obey my commands, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. When we spend time with Jesus and we actually love God with all our heart and we love our neighbour as ourselves, we actually have a good relationship with God. And you actually begin to have good relationship with the people around you. And when you have good relationship, what is the fruit? Joy. You actually enjoy life when you have good relationships with God, good relationships with people around you. And the best way to have good relationships with people around you is by heeding what Jesus says and putting it into practice. And so Jesus is saying, listen to me. Do what I say. You will walk in love and you will reap joy and you will bear fruit that last for eternity brings glory to God. But the longer we stay disconnected from Jesus, just doing life out there in the world, the more we start becoming like the world and we become narcissistic, we suddenly find ourselves doing things that we never expected to do. We find that there's very little joy in our life and most of what we're doing is not significant in eternity at all. It's with Jesus that we keep perspective. So God actually sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to bring us back into a relationship with God. Jesus actually came to us and through his miracles, through his resurrection from the dead, he was saying, look, I'm God. I actually care about you. I'm God. And then he went to the cross and he spread his arms and he said, do you see how much I love you? I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm not trying to take advantage of you. I love you so much I could die for you. And so he proved to us that he was God. He proved to us that we could trust him because he cares about us. And he did this so that as we listen to him, as we learn from him, we learn how to love. We reap joy. We bear fruit, not just, I am the gate for the sheep. The message is, I am Emmanuel, God with us. He doesn't just want to meet us one off in a a sinner's prayer, he wants to live with us every day of our lives. And so what does that look like for you in 2017? Do you know God? So coming to church is really actually important because you've been listening to Jesus' words. But spending time in Jesus' words yourself during the week, praying, repenting when he shows you you're doing something wrong, is how we remain in him. And that's what he wants. He wants us to remain in him because that's how he gives us life. 
Friends, as I finish up, I just want to show you one more quote from the Old Testament. It's a passage where Yahweh actually tells the Jews to remain in him, but it can be applied to Jesus because we know Jesus was fully God. He's, he's saying the same thing. So let me just show you this passage uh, from Deuteronomy 32, 46. Take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day, so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you, they are your life. These are not just idle words, these are actually our life. Do you know them? Are you consuming them? Let me pray. Dear Lord God, we do thank you just for the wonderful privilege of being in your word again today. Lord, we, we know that you actually speak to us through your word. And Lord, some of us here today have probably been convicted from things you've said, have recognised that they need to spend more time with you or they need to take your word a little bit more seriously. Lord, if that is the case, please help them to remember that that they will not just leave church today and forget what they have heard, but that they will make the changes in their life necessary to actually remain in Jesus' word as we need to. And Lord, as we do that, we pray that you'll help us as a church to truly work in, walk in your love, reap that joy that really means something and actually produce fruit that brings glory to you forever. We pray and ask all this today in Jesus' name. Amen.